Our next speaker is Marcus Weldon, and he is considered to be one of the world's leading luminaries in uh, ICT. Uh, he is uh, a man who has uh, matched vision with action, and uh, he has combined this vision and activity in uh, Bell Labs. Uh, he's the former president of Bell Labs globally and uh, a recipient of an Emmy, uh, which I, I didn't realize. Marcus, you're very welcome. Before I let you tell us about um, about this work-life balance uh, problem, you might uh, give us a quick explanation of where this Emmy came from. <laughs> You're right. Can you see me okay, Jonathan? I can see and hear you great, Marcus. You're welcome. Uh, so the, the Emmy's right there. Oh, yeah. Nice. Hey, you see, I'm pointing. I can. I can see it. Yeah. yeah. The other thing is actually something my team gave me. They tried to make it bigger than an Emmy uh, when I left <laughs> Bell Labs. But there's the Emmy. Um, yeah. So Bell Labs is this amazing place uh, that innovates purposefully for the I would argue for the good of humanity it happens to have a corporate owner but in fact the vision has always been what is what are the future human needs and then invent the technologies that are missing uh, that, that will enable us to reach a better future and so that Emmy is for uh, innovations in technical matters of course we were not the actors or actresses uh, <laughs> on stage we, we had the separate ceremony where you know no one wants to see you <laughs> uh, but, but we went to that one and won the Emmy, and that one was actually for the invention of uh, the CCD camera, which uh -huh. is actually the imaging system in most digital uh, imaging systems, so cameras, phones, etc., which is how uh, light gets converted into the image that we're actually looking at each other today. So that's what the Emmy is for. That is a, a replica. The real one is in Bell Labs, but you're allowed <laughs> one replica, and they gave that to me uh, as a leaving gift. Well, that's a great story. Uh, Marcus, uh, I'll leave you to your talk and, uh, and I'll, we'll see you on the other side. Uh, Marcus, well done, everyone. Hi, everyone. So I'm going to be talking today about uh, uh, the idea of creating a future value system that I think uh, will allow us all to prosper. And I think the comments by Jonathan and Gillian were really super in terms of uh, introducing the concept. It, it is going to be about productivity. It's also going to be about proximity. So those two things are going to be two big themes. And I'm going to tie them to the concept of uh, the five Ps of the Sustainable Development Goals. And hopefully I will show by the end, uh, when I'll open up for questions uh, led by Cormac, that uh, there's, there's a virtuous cycle in there. And uh, hopefully I can pull that off in, in 30 minutes. So here are the five P's of the Sustainable Development Goals, people, prosperity, peace, partnership, and planet. And they're all, of course, incredibly worthy goals. Uh, they, but they, they tell you a little bit the what of what we would like to achieve, but not necessarily the how. Obviously, there's a lot of emphasis on sustainable, which is a how. But uh, much of the rest of it is, is things like better health, well-being, justice, equality, uh, and sustainable uh, energy consumption or, or production of goods. But it doesn't really tell you how to do that other than do it sustainably and in a way that is in environmentally friendly. So really, uh, for a while now, I've been looking at this uh, from multiple angles, but I think the five Ps are a good introduction to what the what is. But the how, I think, comes down to this, which is that what we really need to do to achieve those five what goals is to increase our productivity. And productivity may seem a little bit industrial to you, but I'm hopefully con to convince you in this uh, talk that productivity is the, the goal of most humans. In fact, maybe all human activity is about increasing productivity in our lives, of which work is a part. And I'm going to argue that another part of the how is proximity. And of course, I'm going to throw in a new, another what, the pursuit of happiness. So I'm going to thematically talk about the five P's, but really how they're wrapped into three P's, which are productivity, proximity, and by the end, I'll hopefully convince you that the pursuit of happiness goes hand in hand with those things. Marcus, I've but, just popped on because we can't see your screen. Um, ah, thank you. You're referencing it there. I'll try again. Yes. Can we now see it? 
No. Okay, I'm going to try one more time. We better now. Yes. Oh, yeah. fantastic. Thanks for popping in. It was no nice problem. to hear from you. It was, uh, we'll blame it on, uh, on a, a technical error. So I'll just go back to the, uh, the part that I was just showing. And that was the, fortunately, it, it really didn't need a slide, is the five uh, Ps of the sustainable development goals and the three Ps in the middle, what I was talking about, productivity, proximity, and the pursuit of happiness. So there we go. That's what I'm going to encapsulate in this talk. So let's start with the proximity topic. Uh, proximity is a bit of a strange one in some ways, right? But uh, what does it mean? Well, it means nearness in space, time, or relationship. And I want to highlight here that between the hunter-gatherer era, which is, of course, genetically, those of you who've read Yuval Harari's book, Sapiens, genetically, we're still sort of hunter-gatherers, but we've evolved into, we think, something else. In fact, most of our inclinations and, and the resonant things we do are still genetically hunter-gatherers. So if we look at the difference between what a hunter-gatherer did and what we, as what I like to call hung hungry consumers, do, we're a bit out of sorts. We are much denser in population than uh, we traditionally were by almost 50 fold. We have a massive number of uh, new connections, but I called them unhuman. It's not that they're inhuman, which always has that sense of slightly torturous, but unhuman is these connections are, are not really meaningful or substantive, whereas we are used to, uh, say, 150 physical connections. And we used to have only one degree of separation from the people we, we had those connections with. And now we have on the order of four degrees of separation. So we're feeling a little bit at odds, I would argue, genetically with our existence. And so one of the themes of my talk is going to be that we need a new form of proximity where we are actually more local. But of course, what COVID has taught us and Gillian was saying is that we might want to be virtually local. And so that's going to be a point I build on. And we need technology to help us be virtually local, but more meaningfully connected than we have been in the past. So proximity is going to play that sort of human role, but it's also going to play a technological role in my talk. It's going to put requirements on the technology as well. So now let's look at this productivity part. Remember, my three parts of my of, of the how are going to be proximity, productivity, and then and another what is the pursuit of happiness. So this is the the productivity growth rate uh, from a famous book by Robert Gordon called The Rise and Fall of American Growth. This is the rise up through the second industrial revolution. And these are all growth rates. Uh, here's the next part. This is the so-called third industrial revolution, the Internet age, where productivity growth has dropped. And you could argue I could draw that curve to say it's, it's going asymptotically to zero. Now, that's obviously not desirable if productivity is so important we seem to be diminishing our ability to grow it and then how important is it well look what paul krugman the uh, nobel prize winning economist said productivity isn't everything but in the long run it's almost everything and again i want to emphasize the point that most of what human endeavor has done or accomplished is about making us more productive we produce more things per unit time uh, we achieve more per unit time as productivity. And of course, the right work-life balance would say by doing things more efficiently, we create more time to do other things. And I'm going to make the point later on that by creating more time to do other things, you could call them leisure or entertainment activities, we actually increase our productivity because we're more relaxed, we're more in the moment, we're, we're more uh, productive when we go back to work or back to site. So productivity is a massively important uh, quantity. But what have we done in the Internet age that hasn't increased productivity? Well, this is it. This is what we did with the Internet. And I'm sure you've all seen videos like this. This is uh, one of famous cat videos. Uh, and this is what we used to uh, for all that amazing infrastructure called the, uh, you know, the Internet age with the mobile piece and the and the web fabric behind it. We started watching cat videos or TikTok videos. So that's clearly, I don't think anyone would argue, productivity uh, improving. It may have entertained us, so it may have done something on the leisure side of things, but it clearly didn't increase productivity. And if you look at the data, there's some data from Mary Meeker 
Uh, what we currently, or a couple of years ago now, use our mobile devices for, the highest growth was in shopping, and that only got more so uh, during the pandemic, music, entertainment, media. We do a little bit of banking and financial transactions, so that's perhaps one of the more productive things we do. But pretty much uh, everything else is, is diminishing. Anything that was personalization, anything that was lifestyle games has recently increased, of course. But uh, most of the growth was in shopping and entertainment. So we've created this amazing infrastructure of the internet, and we've just used it to drive consumerism, which isn't productivity enhancing. It's leisure time consuming, it's financially consuming, but it's not uh, productivity enhancing. So let's look at the, those industrial revolutions a little bit more. There have been roughly four, if you count them uh, in a particular way. The first one was all about mechanization of physical tasks. They were local physical tasks that got mechanized, but within a local scope. The machines and engines were produced then. Uh, the second industrial revolution was about automation of more complex distributed processes or, or a succession of processes like the, the uh, automotive or car manufacturing line. So it was more complex physical production processes, but it also gave rise to the internationalization because you could move things over larger distances uh, by some of the automated systems produced. In other words, vehicles allowed you to move goods uh, in a more distributed uh, global way. So it, it led to the first phase of internationalization. The third uh, industrial revolution was the, was the internet age. And you could argue what we did there wasn't quite the same. We did take some physical goods and do something different with them, but we just digitized them. We, we actually created uh, digital versions of things like media and information and entertainment goods but we did it for the things that were relatively easy, easy to digitize. It's relatively easy to digitize something that inherently was being recorded digitally in the end, media, or written digitally, an article. So what we did was spend a lot of time creating an infrastructure that allowed easy to digitize goods to move around. And I would argue that's, that's what the third industrial revolution did. The fourth industrial revolution, the one that's upon us, is really about digitizing the rest of the world. The rest of the world is the harder to digitize parts, the parts that essentially are much more physically sophisticated, physical goods, et cetera. You say, well, how do I digitize a physical good or physical system or physical environment? Well, you have to sensorize it. You have to put sensors on it. You have to connect those sensors to an intelligent system that can operate on the data. You have to have then uh, humans interact with that data in, in uh, resonant ways, in ease, ways that are easy to consume. And then you have robotic things or cyber robotic things where it's actually a human attachment that actually perform those tasks uh, more completely. So that's where we're going. And I would argue that where we have to go, and again, COVID has taught us some of this, is that instead of it being a, a world that at the start of those industrial revolutions was very local and human limited, is that we want this new kind of, it seems almost paradoxical, but global, local, and human augmented. And what I really mean by that is you can access anything from anywhere, that's the global, but in fact, you feel and interact as if you are local. And it's not just about humans working with humans, it's humans being augmented to do superhuman tasks by machines. So let's look at some of the ways in which machines have to help us. This is a, curve that I found fascinating. It's called the Buckminster Fuller Knowledge Doubling Curve. And, and he uh, came up with it many years ago. He was a bit of a polymath. Yes, it was the same Buckminster Fuller of the geodesic dome. But he observed that uh, the amount of data, or if we want to call it knowledge, that was um, uh, becoming available in the world doubled every half-life. So in other words, if for every period of time, half that in in the next half that period of time the knowledge doubled so it's almost a you know a, a double exponent there so he started by saying knowledge was doubling five every 500 years and then it was every 250 years and then it was 125 and so on and so forth so by the end of this we're now at the point where data is doubling every 12 hours and the problem is this this is our ability to uh recall the data so it's human retention it's called the uh, Ebbinghaus forgetting curve. And what it really says is that 
humans have a uh, very limited ability to recall information if we don't repeat it to ourselves. So that's the idea of revising that you're familiar with from school days. But it's as bad as the yellow curve shows that within 30 days after learning something, uh, we have forgotten 90% of what we learned if we didn't refresh. You have to constantly refresh to uh, retain it in, in, a, in a way that allows a facile recall. The problem with that, of course, is if knowledge is doubling every 12 hours, and soon even faster than that, there is no ability to refresh because, in fact, the knowledge base is constantly changing. So this is the conundrum. And the only solution to that conundrum is to have machines help us. So let's build on that point a little bit. What is it that machines actually do for us? And, and this is a, a, um, a paradox from a, a chap called Marvek, Professor Marvek. He's at uh, Carnegie Mellon. And he uh, made the observation that uh, machines find routine human tasks hard, and conversely, humans find tasks that are routine for machines hard. And if you want to understand the types of tasks, machines find it very hard to move, manipulate, and perceive and infer about the physical world because they have no a priori knowledge of the physical world, because that's what humans have spent our entire lifetime, and in fact, our entire genetic lifetime, becoming good at moving around and operating in the physical world. Uh, so, so we've learned the rules of that world and we know them inherently and intrinsically. Conversely, humans have only recently started doing mathematical, logical and data processing tasks. So we find those relatively hard, whereas machines, of course, are designed uh, to do exactly those tasks. And that is no coincidence. It is, of course, a truism that humans have invented machines to help us with the tasks that we're not good at. And so it's no coincidence that the that machines we have help us with mathematics, logic, data processing, in other words, computing, uh, and then repetitive tasks, mechanical tasks that are part of the automata and automated processing that we, we talked about earlier in the first and second industrial revolutions. So there is, in fact, no conflict between man and machine. We have always been symbiotic. And I always rather like this quote from Steven Pinker, uh, which is the main lesson of 35 years of AI research is that the hard problems are easy, and the easy problems are hard because the mental abilities of a four-year-old, in other words, a movement in the physical world, solve some of the hardest engineering problems ever conceived. So we shouldn't feel afraid of the AI uh, uh, that is becoming prevalent in our daily lives. We should rather embrace it because, in fact, we're in control of it uh, to create machines that help us with tasks we're inherently not very good at. So to summarize this part, one of the ways in which machines are going to help us is this, but we, I like to coin the term augmenting our intelligence, not replacing our intelligence. So if you look at the vertical axis, you could argue that that is that scale axis of, you know, humans are not very good at very high replication scale. And the horizontal one is sort of the physicality of the problem, how related to the physical world it is. And you see that really humans are optimum at low scale but high physicality tasks. We're very good at those tasks. Uh, machines, on the other hand, are very good at high scale, low physicality tasks. But really what we need is a balance between the two. We need humans to be able to check machines for the high scale tasks. And we need machines to help check uh, the human task or the human outcome for the high physicality tasks. So this augmented intelligence really is a symbiosis that will exist between humans and machines going forward. It's very important to understand that because it isn't a threat. It is one of the ways we're going to become more productive. And again, back to that key productivity point. So let's frame that, that sort of intellectual part because you could argue that, uh, that uh, knowledge and learning is, is uh, the intellectual part. Let's come back and complete the, the hierarchy of things that humans want. And this is a famous hierarchy called Maslow's hierarchy. And the whole uh, uh, goal of Maslow, who was a psychologist, was to say, what is the set of things humans need to feel satisfied or sated? And, and he built this hierarchy, starting with the most basic needs at the bottom. You see food, drink, shelter. And you will see that you know, the, the, the five Ps of the sustainable development goals are, are represented here quite well. And above that safety, again, the justice and security and without fear of violence parts, parts of the uh, five Ps and you see belonging and love and esteem. And then you get up to the more intellectual needs at the top. 
and, and helping others, of course, is, is another part of uh, the uh, sustainable de development goals with education and free access to education for all. So, so you've got these as the traditional needs of a human. I like to always say that this is uh, one that we've added recently. Uh, there's, a, there's a zero thought a need of free Wi-Fi or free connectivity. Uh, but more importantly, I think what we're really trying to do in this new human machine co-assistance age is, re is map a new set of digital needs we have to our analog needs to create sort of two triangles of truth that coalesce. And they coalesce to create a new productivity paradigm where we create time by allowing us to predict and automate and augment tasks. That's what we typically use machines for. But we have to do that with trust uh, to maintain safety, privacy, and security as we would have done when we were physically proximal to each other. We built trust through physical proximity. So we need to now do that between these this, this new digital realm and the analog realm have to be blended together. And if you look at this digital realm, it is about we need some superhuman capabilities. So we need task assistance. Think of that as a robotics part. We need sensory assistance. We need to sense the physical world so we can better interact with it uh, when we're not within a sensory distance. We obviously need to connect, as I said, because it, these, these uh, sensory data is coming uh, over, across a digital fabric. So we need new networks. We need new data processing paradigms. We need new analytical needs. Of course, that's where AI and machine learning comes in. We need then to be able to think about that AI. So that's sort of a verifiable AI, if you want, that's based in the, the real physical world. So uh, that, that will allow us to, to automate some things. And of course, we need to uh, perceive things correctly. So we actually want to, to then be able to predict new outcomes and not just automation of automata, but perception and contextual uh, um, an analysis, which is presented to a human so we can have a more complete perception of our world. So those, those are the blended uh, old Maslow and new Maslow uh, hierarchy that we need to achieve. So let me now start talking about how we're going to do that. But before I do that, I just want to go to this study to show how important this productivity concept is. This is a study, again, by McKinsey, their, um, their research institute. Uh, they broke down, and this is a couple of years ago, uh, the report was called uh, uh, Beyond the Hype of IoT. And so it was, you remember IoT was a very popular term uh, starting about five years ago, and everyone thought IoT was the future. But in fact, they misunderstood, I think, initially what it was all about. It's not just putting a, a tile or an Apple tag on your keys. IoT was about putting sensors on the physical world so we could digitize that and then interact with, uh, with those digital uh, signals and information more completely to become more productive. And that's what McKinsey very eloquently uh, and clearly stated. So the way to read this is they broke apart each industry into seven uh, essential tasks. The tasks are managing, applying expertise, data collection, data processing, etc. So the vertical parts are the tasks. Horizontally are the different industries uh, need for those tasks. But you see each industry needs the same tasks. The amount they need changes. But the clear point they made was that all the tasks to the right, data collection, data processing, predictable physical work, are highly automatable. That's why they've got the blue and green color coding. You see, is, it makes them highly automatable according to the legend. And if you add those up across all industries, about 50 to 60% of our world, our task world, if you want, or our physical world, is automatable. And that's the productivity opportunity. How big was it? Well, they said between four and $11 trillion could be saved by automating those tasks which would impact 11% of the global economy. And this is a massive change. Typically all the productivity growth data I showed you before, the peak in productivity growth was 3% of the global economy uh, was the, was the, uh, was the uh, increase in productivity growth decade over decade. And we're talking about something that could be 11% uh, in terms of the global economy or GDP could be increased. And again, we're going to do this in a way that humans and machines are cooperating to cre increase our productivity so that we actually have more complete lives with better work-life balance. And we're going to do it, of course, by being virtually proximal. So let's get on to that. So I'd like to build my next point about the value of 
productivity and proximity by looking uh, across the third industrial revolution. This is, these are the decades of the third industrial revolution. Uh, you can say the 80s were supercomputing, the 90s, the web and, and sort of desktops, the 2000s, first mobile phones, the 2010s, um, smartphones and, and, uh, and cloud. The key point is the value stacks, and read this by the light blue is, is premium value, the gray is commodity value. The value stacks changed every decade as we shifted from supercomputers to desktops to beginning to communicate over wireless infrastructure to combining a desktop and wireless infrastructure into a smartphone. I like to think that the smartphone isn't a phone at all, it's a smart mobile computer. We just call it a phone because it looks like a phone, but in fact, it's a it's a mobile computing device, and we've I think all become accustomed to that. But every decade it shifts, and the decade we're entering, I would argue, is another value shift. And I've already previewed what I think the new value statements are. They are new sensory technologies that allow us to sense the world, new robotics technologies that allow us to control the world, new augmented reality that allows us to sort of see the world. Think of that as the headsets, if you wanted. Uh, and then we need a new network type, and it is a, what 5G is, is uh, designed for, but we need proximity, and that's edge cloud is going to be one of the proximal dimensions. And then we need augmented intelligent systems that help us think about the world, and, and those are the new value paradigms. And in fact, what I'm going to convince you is all of that has to be condensed to running relatively locally or allowing us to interact with relatively local systems across virtual infrastructure. So this is the new value paradigm that we have to be building and designing. So a quick nod to COVID, it did teach us the proximity lesson, but not just that physically proximal is perhaps more satisfying to us in terms of we learned uh, that the loss of physical proximity to humans, we really uh, felt uh, quite uh, uh, remarkably and, and, and tangibly. But actually, that we also need to be able to remotely interact with things and feel proximal. So uh, these are some of the remote things we learned that we need to do. We need to remote work and learn, or the educational and schooling. We need to remote diagnose, of course, with uh, with healthcare uh, going online for the first time. We, of course, need to have constantly optimized connectivity. So we need a remotely optimized, dynamic op optimized connectivity from anywhere to anywhere. We obviously want to remotely entertain ourselves with uh, regular entertainment, but also mixed reality experiences going forward. Tracking, tracking was something that seemed mundane, but in fact it became so essential, not just to supply chains, logistics, but also to tracking, of course, the spread of infection. Uh, and then the, uh, the ability to remotely survey and understand our world, and of course secure that world, as we've already mentioned in the introduction. Th these were the COVID lessons. They were sort of on the radar before that, but everyone thought they were some point in the future. And I think we now understand they are today, that we need a physical proximity for certain tangible things that we need to be close to. But if ever more um, uh, presently, we need virtual proximity. So I want to indicate this so, or, or highlight this, that this is not something that we can dawdle over. We can't take our time over making the shift we need to make because, in fact, uh, it's now upon us. Again, I, I see COVID as a catalyst that perhaps woke everyone up to a new reality. And, and those who get it will move fast. And those who perhaps don't take advantage of this, this wake up call will become uh, laggards. So the left-hand side of this chart is, again, data from McKinsey showing what happened in the e-commerce segment during the first three months or so of, uh, of the pandemic. And you see that because e-commerce had prepared itself with sufficient infrastructure to grow at speed, in fact, it had pre-prepared, uh, it achieved 10 years growth in three months. And you could argue that what we're really going to see now in the near future is all the systems that haven't yet prepared themselves, the, call them the cyber physical systems where we're digitally interacting or digitally connecting the physical world, uh, now are go going to undergo the same growth led by 5G networking, edge cloud technologies, new sensory technologies, new robotics technologies, new AI ML technologies. When those combine, you're going to see a similar rise in, in productivity uh, as was uh, seen during 
the, the, the pandemic with the systems that were already there, with the digital systems that were already there, which were the e-commerce systems and associated web platforms. So we have to pre be prepared to lead, not to lag. And that's a comment about Ireland. It's a comment about any nation uh, that uh, it's critical to get this right, to create productivity improvement with proximity. And I'm going to get back to the pursuit of happiness. So a little bit more on the tech side. On the tech side, why is the world going towards this proximity uh, imperative uh, just to increase productivity? So I want to explain that a little bit more. Uh, humans on the left here, we typically sense things, whether it's seeing, hearing, tasting, or smelling with about 100 milliseconds of timing. That's just how our brains process things. But if I go to the right-hand side here, uh, machine systems, control systems, typically process things with about a one millisecond cycle time. And that's a very big difference. Why? Because it means that uh, we can no longer have our networks and control systems taking the data tens of thousands of kilometers away. We have to have them within a one millisecond interval, which actually is going to mean about within 10 to 100 kilometers. And that's simply due to the speed of light. And I'm going to show you that on the next slide. So because we've moved from a 100 millisecond human paradigm to a one millisecond machine paradigm, we need to be much closer. But there's a key point here. Humans actually can do two things faster than hearing, seeing, tasting, and smelling, and that is touch and something called the vestibular ocular reflex, which is your movement in a headset when you're perceiving motion. We do that in one to 10 milliseconds. So this is where I connect the idea of a machine needing one milliseconds, but it turns out that humans, if we want to remotely perceive touch uh, systems and, and data, also need one millisecond uh, order of magnitude. So humans and machines will be symbiotic and enable us to remotely control all the types of things I show in the picture. We'll be able to remotely control uh, the, you know, the delivery, the assembly, the packaging, the transport of those finished goods, all by creating a wireless infrastructure, and I'll, I'll explain why wireless, with one millisecond timing that we can remotely interact with uh, as if we're virtually proximal. So why wireless? Well, actually, the, the major part of the productivity uh, conundrum or limitation we have today is that everything is fixed. There are wires tethering everything. So for example, I can't reconfigure everything without moving a bunch of wires around. I can't have people who are inherently mobile interact with those fixed things in a nat natural way because in fact, they can't communicate with each other. And the same with robotic things. So it's the lack of reconfigurability or interaction between machines, moving machines and moving humans and moving packages and moving goods. When everything's moving, we need to be wireless. So the 5G, uh, imperative, the networking imperative, is to allow everything to be reconfigurable and remotely uh, controllable over a new wireless infrastructure and humans and machines working in harmony over that infrastructure. So a simple way to summarize what I've just said, there are really two imperatives here. There's the need to compute locally because I need to solve that one millisecond timing requirement. And, and here on the left, you see this is the speed of light mapped to how far it travels in a given period of time. And in one millisecond, light can only travel there and back, round trip, uh, 100 kilometers. So right there, we see that there's no longer possible to compute 10,000 kilometers away in a massive data center. You have to compute within the latency interval of that machine and human system, so which is in within 10 to 100 kilometers. So that's the movement to proximal or proximity for computing. The other part is we need a network that connects that computing and sensory and human system uh, with lower latency as well uh, and with higher reliability. And that's the, uh, the goal of 5G. I show here the parameterization of uh, LTE and the relative values for 5G. In capacity, 5G will be much higher capacity, which of course we need for all those machine systems to come online. It'll be much more reliable. I don't want a three nines reliable system that goes out uh, you know, a thousandth of the time, that doesn't sound bad. It's very bad if it's a mission critical system. It's going out several times a day. So I need six nines of reliability. And then of course I need the one millisecond 
latency that supports the one millisecond timing requirement for the computing systems. So that's the big shift is we're going to have a new computing paradigm at the edge and a new networking paradigm that connects the computing systems with the sensory systems and the human systems. So I just wanted to flash this up. This is where I see the future is a human machine physical world symbiosis. And right at the core is that augmented computing at the edge and augmented networking, starting with 5G and moving to 6G. I see those as the brain and the nervous system that will be the foundation of our new productive world. Around that are lots of things that look like, again, the five Ps, augmented healthcare, augmented security, augmented energy systems, augmented life and environmental systems. We have to use that brain and nervous system to augment all those other systems by sensorizing them and being able to interpret them and optimize them. So that's the new domains of sort of physical infrastructure augmentation. But there's a companion set, because that's only 10 if you count that up, there's, there's 10 elements here. Here is the human companion. We actually have to augment ourselves with intelligent thinking systems and, and, and cyborg systems, essentially physical assistance systems, new communications paradigms that feel more immersive, new physiological sensing paradigms, new perception paradigms. And if we couple the human part with the, the infrastructure part, this is the, uh, the new reality, I think, that will drive our new productivity paradigm that leads us to be able to be virtually proximal, highly productive, and pursue happiness. So back to the point about the pursuit of happiness. I said I would get there. I love this quote by Helen Keller, that knowledge is actually happiness, because to have knowledge, broad, deep knowledge, is to know true ends from false and lofty things from low. And I don't think there could be a better statement about our current existence, that if we could truly, as individuals and collectives, be able to distinguish true ends from false and lofty things from low and have real knowledge that we would all be happier for that real knowledge. So my summary is going to be the following. Well, M Marcus, I do want to get to questions shortly. Yes. So uh, if you can. I am just time. wrapping up. So here is uh, my, my uh, virtuous cycle. We're going to increase productivity by being globally, locally proximal. We're going to do it by people and machines in partnership, creating a new prosperity, that that prosperity will drive peace and the pursuit of happiness, which in turn increases productivity. So there we go. That's the, uh, that's the way I see the world going forward. Really interesting stuff. I particularly love the digital analog of Abraham uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And though, you know, that slide you had about um, human technology, I think that, um, uh, interfacing with, with technology. I think that's not as far away as we might think. Um, I'm going to invite a Professor uh, Cormac Sreenan on now who will lead a question and answer session uh, with Marcus. If you have questions, don't forget in the Q&A section of uh, the stage and uh, we'll, Mark, Cormac will get to as many of them as he can. Cormac, I'd love you to have you over to you. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Jonathan. I presume you can all hear me well. Uh, good to see you, Marcus. It's been an early start for you, um, I, I, I realise, but nice to see you again. Hi, Cormac. Good to see you. And, and thank you for the, the delightful and um, uh, insightful talk presented with great acuity. And, and I think, um, really, your, your vision, I think, is, uh, uh, is of a new epoch, really, in terms of human-machine uh, interaction. So it's very, very exciting. And I think for the, uh, the delegates, at the Tech Fest today, one that hopefully will raise um, uh, interesting opportunities. But uh, we might come back to that later. I, I, I did smirk a little bit when I saw your slide on degrees of separation um, and going from one to four, because of course people in Cork like to think um, that they have one or at most two degrees of separation with pretty much everyone. Um, so if you were if you were here in person, I have no doubt that at the coffee break somebody would be uh, would be asking you if you're. If you know the uh, the Weldons from uh, from West Cork and making sure they have a connection in that respect, <laughs> <laughs> that's very funny, Cormac. Uh, I, I like that. But uh, but very interesting talk. I, I thought it was interesting the title of your talk where you said it was the future is a value equation. Um, and I guess uh, to the scientists in the audience in particular, this is quite an interesting way of of talking about the way the future is going to evolve. Um, and I suppose what I might ask you then is, do you think this equation is actually solvable? And 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 what's the dominant variable in this equation? 
Great question, Cormac. I, I think in the end it's a circular equation, which is quite hard, right? Uh, because uh, it's it's not linear. Um, but of course, that 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 then gives rise to some. The, the power of the equation is that it it's, it feeds in on itself in a recursive way. So I'd say it's a recursive equation, which are harder to solve typically. Um, solvable? Yes, I, I I do think so. I think if if we build out what I indicated, which is sensorize the world, so that's just so allows us to see it. Um, we're overwhelmed by the data that will produce. So then we create computing systems that are local that are connected. Uh, with intelligent systems that optimize that data that are rooted in reality. So we have to teach those systems about the physical world. It can't just be simple pattern recognition. They have to actually understand the world a bit. But then humans will monitor and manage those systems, of course, because we are experts in the world and we'll never stop being experts in the world because that's that's essentially how we've evolved. I do think it's solvable. And, and we're beginning to see some of that uh, come into being. And And I think COVID has has made us aware, as Gillian said earlier, that we can do this, right? Uh, in a weekend, we managed to change how we lived and worked. And yes, there was some um, angst and and uh, and uh, perturbation caused by that. But within a matter of weeks, we were actually all getting pretty good at things we thought were pretty much impossible before that. It was just conceptual and, and wishful thinking or perhaps undesirable. And, and we found that we could do it and, and we, are doing it so I, I do think it's possible but it does require coherence in action so if there's a message here for cork or ireland in general coherent action is the only way to achieve this because chaotic action where you know some cloud provider isn't connected to a high performance network and the sensory data isn't being connected to the computing system uh, that won't help so we the, the hard part of this is how do we do this coherently i think yeah, no, absolutely. I, I agree entirely. I think the uh, the coordination and coherence of this is is a fundamental step towards the uh, towards the vision you you described. And I, I noticed as well you you focus very much on productivity, which is a it's a very interesting uh, if you like va variable to think about. And and I like the way you talked about it over the uh, over the centuries and, and also most recently. Um, and I suppose just just to be devil's advocate for a minute, right? So some people in the audience might be saying, well, you know, um, I can't even get good digital assistance to help help me with my email, right? I'm overwhelmed. So all of this digital world has actually created more work for me, right, rather than less work. So to, to someone who might be somewhat of a skeptic, let's say, um, can you say something by way of reassuring them that the march of technology in this direction is really going to lead to increased productivity or is it just going to lead to increased activity? Well, that's, that's good. We should have that as the headline uh, <laughs> for some article. Increased productivity or just increased activity. I would argue we've been through the increased activity uh, and in fact, it's increased so much that we've become inactive, I would argue, and passive, just passing through data not really reading email, et cetera, just mm -hmm. scanning, right? So I think we've gone in the wrong direction, and that's essentially what the uh, Buckminster Fuller knowledge doubling curve is. It hasn't been knowledge we've created, it's noise. We've created noise, and we've become inefficient because of that. And then when we added in long commuting times to, to work, to the noise that we created at work, I always said to my team is the old office memo if we think about it, at least was well thought out and relatively infrequent. So it wasn't overwhelming and it was coherent, even if it didn't perhaps allow you to adapt minute by minute. The office memo was a, a good construct. And we've replaced that because it with with quick emails and texting and, and chat, uh, and it hasn't improved things. So I think we've got to go back to more reasoned thought and analysis. And I think the way we'll do that is machines will offload us from the noise and we'll able, be able to learn our behaviors. So to your point about uh, systems haven't really helped, I, I agree with that. I think we need personalized assistants that learn our behaviors. I always think of it as the little angel, or hopefully not mm -hmm. the devil, uh, that is looking at how we interact and then ord ordering and prioritizing things that matter to us and then informing us with other information that's relevant to us. In some ways, I think of augmented reality. If you think of it in the headset way, because I think it's easy to think of it. If I was looking at you, Cormac, here, my headset would be telling me everything I needed to know about Cormac. 
or the context for the question that you just asked me, because perhaps you had some background in that question. And so I could more completely understand your particular context. And when I answered, you would know my context of making the comments I'm making. And of course, that's a really good way to think about how humans could be augmented if there were a system that knew us a bit better. It still kept our privacy, but it, at least in the moment could say, hey, Cormac, Marcus thinks about things this way. So then you could, you know, you would know me more completely. And that's where I think we will feel virtually more connected as if we had those all the tangibility of being in the same room where we sort of read a, those clues about how each other thinks and feels. Uh, I think that's something really important. We have to take the massive data, contextualize it and present it in a way that's natural and important for the individual at that point in time, just in time. So we get back to that real time uh, part of things as well. Hmm. So that, that sounds fascinating. I, I love the augmented reality example. I suppose it does make one aware, though, that you become more reliant on on the technology in in that case. And, and I suppose it leads leads nicely to to the next question I was going to refer to you, which is to do with reliability, right, of technology and and the trust we can put in technology. You mentioned um, in terms of future productivity and your vision, um, the reliance on sensors, obviously, the Internet of Things to some extent, um, and also automation. Um, and um, I just want to mention the uh, the events in the U.S. a couple of weeks ago with Colonial uh, Oil Pipeline, right, where where the oil pipeline was hacked. Um, and I know there was um, there was a certain amount of um, I suppose um, uh, incredulity in the uh, in in the general public in the sense of what why why was an oil pipeline on the internet, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> Good question. Yeah. And um, I suppose my, my question then is, I suppose, just may, maybe leveraging that as an example, um, uh, and you did briefly mention cybersecurity issues. Um, is that um, a risk that we can overcome um, in terms of the, the future vision of, um, you know, a greater reliance on digital assistance, on digital technology to assist us on a day to day basis? So going back to the, to the example you mentioned, if my augmented reality system is hacked, does that mean I can no longer communicate with you? Yes, <laughs> I, I should expand on that. Of course, uh, I think the way security has to be handled going forward is one of the nice parts of having contextual systems is those contextual systems will be looking for abnormal behavior. So they have to learn normal. Just like I talked about learning the physical world, some of the problem with those systems today is they don't even know what normal is. So we have to train those systems to recognize normal, but then we need to train them to recognize acceptable abnormal, which is me. Uh, I like to think I'm acceptably abnormal, but uh, but I, I think the, the idea is we're all a bit abnormal. But if we can train systems to recognize physical normal and physical, I think cyber physical counts, a pipeline is a good example, and then physical abnormal, because there's a contextual variance in that, uh, that's how we'll protect and raise alerts that we're beyond the boundary of those things. And, and I think that's uh, the way we have to look at it, is every system that we bring online has to have a knowledge system that understands it, but also understands the abnormal or the contextualization of that system, and then raises alerts when something aberrant happens. Because this is well beyond what any human can see. Some of the ransomware attacks and the intrusion attacks are, are so-called uh, uh, advanced persistent threats, they used to be called APTs, and what that is, is a type of threat where a small amount of something is inserted, sits there stealing your data. Now, ransomware is the approach uh, where essentially they've, they've just locked up your data and will only give it back to you. But it's a similar idea, small amount of data, which they exfiltrate uh, and it's gone. It's a one transaction, but it's taken your most prized possession, your data or your control system, uh, and, then, and then owning that. So it's so hard to see because the event itself is tiny, almost invisible. But, but in fact, if, if you look at the patterns that gave rise to it, you can always discern these small signals if you had an expert system that says that thing shouldn't be talking to that other thing, even if it's just one byte of data, those two should not be exchanging. And a human can't see that, right? A human can't see one byte transaction or one megabyte transaction that is that critical uh, event. We need machines sort of monitoring this for us and then presenting to us contextualized, meaningful alerts. I think that's where cybersecurity has to go. So again, it's wrapped into this idea of understanding the world appropriately before you can really secure the world.
Mm, yeah, no, that, that's a very interesting perspective. So, and, and automating the understanding of the world as well, right? Which is the key, exactly. the key, the key feature. Yeah, yeah. So, turning a little bit from the technology vision itself, and I, I mean, I suppose the background to your to your presentation was set in the the context of the sustainable development goals, and um, I, I suppose looking at the the wider social impact of um, uh, and global impact of the uh, the vision that you that you charted. Um, is there a danger that this uh, increased productivity, increased digitalization will uh, will affect uh, the the more developed nations and and bypass um, nations which are less developed? Um, or is there some way in which you think we can we can use it to to bring those nations to a greater stage of development? Yeah, I, I very much like that question. Uh, that prosperity has to be for all, mm. and I will argue that. As long as there's a baseline infrastructure of connectivity, uh, and it doesn't have to be 5G per se, but it, the more advanced the connectivity, the better. But as long as you've got that basic infrastructure, the other requirements, if you think about it, are putting sensors on things, but those could be solar powered sensors and they're in, intended to be you know, a few uh, pence or cents. Mm. They're not the most sophisticated things. They're things that just say on off, sun no sun water no water that they, they can be fairly rudimentary sensory things that are battery powered or solar powered a network that connects them and a cloud that has to be within a hundred or so kilometers so in a in a nearby city although it needn't be in a city it could be sort of in a you know a, in a bigger town that is fairly minimal infrastructure uh and then the ai system should be available to all right because they're not they shouldn't be specific to that geography too much. They should actually be an agricultural system should work in many different places. So it doesn't really matter where it was engineered. It should actually be portable to that infrastructure. So I think as long as we can solve the basic connectivity and computing and sensing part, I think we can be all prosperous. And in fact, I'll add back in the expert. If an expert can remote dial in our virtual proximity, and help the local person who perhaps can't necessarily interpret uh, the data or access the AI system in, you know, that's, that's most suited to them. But if an expert can advise them, even if not in perfect real time, in near real time, use this system, this is what the data means, this is the tool you need, uh, which again, uh, virtual proximity uh, allows, then we've really got a way that we can help uh, prosperity across the globe without being there. Equally, we can empathize, I think, more because we will be able to see the predicament rather than just hear a report of the predicament. We'll be able to viscerally see and experience it, I think, in a way that perhaps increases our empathy for, for that. So that, that'll be a catalyst to want us to help. And then our ability to help will go up. And I think that's the, the positive reinforcement that get, makes me uh, very hopeful that this will be for all and not for some. No, that's very interesting. I, I, I like the link between proximity and um, and and the the ability to to spread the prosperity, so, so to speak. I think that that makes absolute sense. Um, I just 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 to mention as well for people who are listening in, if you want to submit questions um, that you'd like me to ask uh, to ask, ask Marcus on your behalf, please do put them into the to the Q and A and like questions that are already in there so that we can see which ones are the uh, um, are the most popular. Um, I suppose following from my previous question a little bit, Marcus, the, and, and you did mention refer to this in your talk, um, the, the other group that one would generally be concerned about with the march towards automation are the, uh, the, the less skilled workers. Um, and I suppose, if you wouldn't mind, just give me your perspective a little bit on that. I, I, I suppose making sure that we don't leave leave people behind um, as we yeah, it's a great one, Cormac, again. Um, I'm actually super positive on this one because I'll go back to my headset. It, by the way, it could be an earpiece. So think headset or earpiece, like Air AirPods. If I could be told exactly how to perform the task I need to be performing, then my educational background is irrelevant. In fact, what might matter most is my physical skills, which mm. would say that what we traditionally have called manual or physical labor or blue collar work whatever we called it will actually become the most prized thing because if i can be told what to do or educated as to live educated what to do the only limitation will be my physical skills which means physical skills will become a premium 
And it's actually the physical skills that are the hardest for the robotic system to do. Back to my what are humans and machines good at? Machines are pretty bad at complex physical tasks. They're good at repetitive physical tasks, move this thing there repeatedly. They're pretty bad at, at subtle manipulations and dynamic adaptations to those manipulations, which humans are super at. So I would argue the traditionally less educated might be elevated in this and should be elevated in this new regime because they will have access to real-time education about the thing, task, and their physical skills will come to the fore. I actually think the people who will suffer here will middle managers. Middle managers should go, uh, and that might be all of us. But uh, now middle managers meaning people who just pass data from one place to another. That that role will be gone. I think uh, uh, higher cognitive functions, people doing serious thinking and analysis, will be maintained. Middle management, where it's just passing data from one place to another, probably can be replaced by a machine system. And lower down, physical tasks will be highly prized. So I think it's an adjustment is my short answer, but I don't think it disadvantages the physical labor world. Uh, it, it rather advantages them, I think. Okay, that's great. And um, I suppose you, you and I both worked at Bell Labs, in fact, around the same time, <laughs> I, I think. Um, and you mentioned it in your talk as part of the, uh, the innovation ecosystem, I guess. Um, and you, we have a, you know, an interesting mix of delegates here today from large companies, uh, research labs, universities, uh, small companies, startups. Um, in terms of innovating for, for the vision that you described, what do you think is sort of the, the different roles, for, in particular the role of the large research labs, uh, the Bell Labs and the others, um, versus academia, versus startups? Just briefly, how do you, how do you think they, they come together? It's a really good question again. Uh, I think the large industrial labs have to take more responsibility for integrating many pieces because academia typically doesn't do that sort of thing, don't build systems so much as individual inventions. So I think academia will build individual inventions, but should actually be more collaborative with industry or with other academic institutions to try and start building systems that are coherent. But I think industry has to take the lead on making sure the systems are built. And startups, again, uh, I think more collaboration. I think startups, tremendously powerful innovators, they don't necessarily invent, but they implement, and the implementation is, is, is creates the new business, but not very collaborative typically, rather sort of uh, focused on their own thing and, and, and then just open, using open source for the rest. Uh, so I, I think perhaps the short answer is a bit more symbiosis, again, between academia, startups, and industry to create coherent systems uh, that, that actually perform as we would like with everyone delivering value and not anyone trying to take the value from the other. So that's what I would say. Okay, no, really, really good. Thank you, uh, Marcus. I'm going to turn to some of the audience questions now. We have a question um, submitted by Martin Casey, um, and, and he asks, how should we consider implementing ethical guidelines to ensure the advancements in the abilities of AI don't interfere with our human rights, with various human rights? Yeah, yeah it's yeah. a really good one, isn't it? Um, yeah, I, I think we have to have we have to have a human in the value chain. It's always about augmenting our intelligence. So in the augmentation, there's always a human that is making a judgment about whether that recommended action is acceptable. And and I, I think that applies for everything, whether it's a biomedical thing or a, a data privacy thing or whatever it is. I think a human has to be in there. And the question is, which human? I think in the end, the only answer can be you or someone you have designated as your proxy should actually be the one that ultimately says yay or nay. So I think that somewhere in this, your personal assistant has to be able to answer on your behalf, yes or no. And then the the entity, the machine entity, the digital entity has to respect that. And I think that's it. So it's not that there's a wise body necessarily overseeing everything in an omniscient way. I think we could, you can take advice from those sorts of things, but ultimately you need the right to say yes or no to each one of these interactions uh, and, and be able to control that. And, and so I think it comes down to personal with a personal assistant has to be the way. Okay, thank you. And the next question then from Brian Holohan. And because of future latency time requirements, and will the location of data centers be important slash competitive advantage for the attraction of non-tech industries? 100% yes. So Ireland 
will become its own data center economy uh, with all data centers being within Irish borders because everything else is, well, apart from Northern Ireland, 100 kilometers away. So uh, you could even argue the uh, UK is, is probably slightly too far away for some of these things. So um, I, I would say, yes, you need the infrastructure, the 5G infrastructure to connect the data center. Um, and you need the AI systems running. But as I said, you can port those AI tools onto your data center infrastructure. So yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, and a, a question from Laura Hughes, um, in, in, in keeping with the innovate theme of the, of the events today, what would you consider one of the best innovations in 2020, 2021? Best innovations in 2020, 2021. I actually think it's, it's weird, but virtual communications, which isn't an innovation from 2020, 2021, it's actually an innovation from 1990. Remember video telephony, mm -hmm. uh, but the the fact that we could virtualize comms and feel like we're together is. But all innovations tend to be thirty years old, just rediscovered. So I rather like that as an example. Uh, we probably that, and then of course the IT infrastructure that allowed us to work and live and and consume and produce. Uh, so the networking infrastructure that supported this, I think, is is probably what I would say. Not very interesting as an answer, but foundational. Yeah, no, and, and interesting because I, I suppose it, it would also maybe let me to ask you um, uh, in terms of COVID. Um, I mean, you, you refer to it in your talk, but there has been very significant um, uh, reliance, obviously, but also some upheaval. You would say in the in the tech sector as a result of COVID. Um, what do you think will be the lasting impact? I mean, apart from the, um, the issues maybe that Gillian talked about in her um, opening uh, discussion about working remotely, uh, from a technology point of view, do you think there will be a lasting impact from the, uh, from the pandemic? I do. I think we're going to now get used to living in a, in a virtual proximal world where we're much more productive. I think we now want that. As Gillian said, it was a sort of nice to have, maybe not nice to have, some employers thought, people won't be productive. In fact, productivity has gone up. We've saved the driving time. We've, we're perhaps more complete human beings, better family lives. So I do think that's the lasting and very positive thing. And I'll go back to my previous answer. I think we have to give credit to the vaccine development as probably one of the most innovative things in 2021 that was to say the thing on top of the infrastructure uh, was vaccine development, a tremendous uh, uh, accomplishment there. No, here, 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 and in, in, in a remarkably short period of time, I think. Uh, and the supply chain to get it produced and delivered and administered, that part was all done with very, what I would like to say is prescient or, or of the future, productivity much higher than we'd ever seen productivity in vaccine development because of collaboration across digital divides, right? And then the supply chain and the management of that was increased in its productivity by, again, digital infrastructure. So maybe that ties back after all to say, that's the type of world we'll live in where we'll solve problems instantaneously, more or less, uh, relative to the time scale of the problem. Yeah, no, absolutely. And that, that, that impresses everyone, I think. Yeah, absolutely. So to, to a, I mean, I, I'm, in, I'm in a university, obviously, Marcus, as you know. So to a student who's starting off in the area of, of, um, of technology generally, um, what advice might you give them? in terms of what, 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 they, what they should do on a personal basis or in terms of a particular path they might follow in their career? Yeah, um, good question. I, I think embrace the future. Uh, there's a famous quote by Alan Kay uh, that is the best way to predict the future is to invent it. So I would say participate in inventing the future. If you think my talk has some uh, re relevance or resonance, Think about what you could do to invent that future and then be a leader in creating that future. Uh, so th and then take a degree or, or maybe don't take a degree. Uh, do it, you know, an apprenticeship or, or learn on the job uh, towards that goal. Um, I think that's what I would say. Di diversify the way you think about the world a little bit. Don't be too linear about you have to go through a certain path, uh, but know what problem you're solving. One of the great Bell Labs. Uh, in, inventors was a guy called Richard Hamming and what he always said is find the most important problem you can work on uh, and and then solve that and I, I really like that way of thinking about the world what's the most important problem figure it out 
work out how to solve it, what you can do to solve it. Uh, and that's the advice I would give. And never give up. There are amazing people who will help you. People are intrinsically good. Uh, and across digital media, I've been really surprised and delighted by how many people want to help each other in the new reality uh, to, for, to help them achieve bigger and better things. So, so take advantage of that. So we're nearly out of time, Marcus. One one quick question, just to just to finish up. And I suppose it's really, and um, we're, we're all aware of your uh, career accomplishments, and and many people in the audience are probably saying, "What's next for Marcus Weldon?" Yeah. So uh, the I'm uh, back to the Emmy. <laughs> I, I I think I need an Oscar uh, or a Nobel Prize. No, it's really not that. Those are awards that recognise human accomplishments. So I, my my serious answer is, I want to do something that's. Uh, of human significance and that picture behind the little thing hanging from the bird uh, the tag says rise and shine and I rather like the idea of every day rising and trying to shine and deliver on the vision I've outlined in some meaningful way yeah wonderful it's been, it's been a wonderful chatting to you Marcus and thank you again for your for your keynote at this point I'm going to hand back to uh, to Jonathan thanks everyone Thanks, Marcus. That, that was brilliant uh, and, and really enjoyed the chat, Cormac. Thanks very much. We'll be